Hello and welcome. My name is Mark Sanchez, Senior Counsel and Founder of Contract In-House Counsel, the FDA Addy. It's a great pleasure to be with you and today we're talking about warning letters. Warning letters from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and in particular, how do we build a response to the agency and what kind of responses should we avoid? But to start, we need to talk about what is a warning letter. And the first, it's really the first step in any enforcement action. And really, we can actually call it the first enforcement tool used by the FDA. This is going to come before any seizure, any sort of administrative detention, civil or criminal penalties. There will be a warning letter. It's going to indicate all the serious violations of the statute or the regulations for that particular industry, dietary supplement, drug, medical device, whatever the regulated category, those regulations and statutes are going to be evaluated. There's only 15 days to respond to a warning letter. It's a little bit longer than we have for Form 43, but still not a whole lot of time to craft a really good response. And a poor response can have some consequences, and one of those consequences is going to be to drag the process out. Warning letters are not something you want to have looming over your facility, and a poor response can keep that cloud there for a year, two years, and even in some cases up to three years, and that's a long time to have agency review. A poor response can also lead to additional enforcement actions. Those tools that I mentioned, seizures, administrative detentions, facility suspension, all of those things can come from a poor response where the FDA is left with the impression that something's not right at this facility and these issues are not going to be taken care of and the public's going to be put at risk as a result. So a poor response is something that we can avoid and that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to begin by looking at what responses to avoid. And this is three categories that we can kind of have some fun with, but it's really important lessons in here. And this first one I call the Three Stooge response, and really it's one of the most common responses given. And a few of the attributes are it's very hastily written, fired off typically the first day or even the second day that a Form 43 or a warning letter is received. It's very dismissive. It doesn't address any of the issues in the warning letter or the Form 43. It just says, yeah, yeah, we got it. It's under control. It's very vague because it doesn't address any of the issues, and it's very general about how those issues are going to be resolved. So it doesn't give a very strong impression that the facility has a good sense of what happened and what's the violation. So how do we remedy this kind of violation, or better yet, how do we just avoid it? And the best tip I can provide is to be specific. Be specific by answering each observation, each issue that's raised. Be on time, but be very thoughtful. You don't have to rush off a response. The next response that we will talk about is the anger management response. And this is just an incredibly common and very difficult to re uh, remediate. It's hard to fix this one. And here are some of the attributes. They will see a lot of talk about free speech or other constitutional rights. You'll see that it completely avoids the issues or the observations that were made. And it even goes as far as to attack the agency. It really wastes precious time and it risks that relationship you have with the district office. Think about it, you're going to be in that district unless your facility moves for some reason, and so you really want to build a good relationship with that district director, those field investigators. The best way that you can respond is to be cool, be calm, and as always, be specific. And if you do feel there are some legal challenges, verify those with an expert so that they can put them in a way that is diplomatic, is appropriate for the forum, and actually gets those legal challenges listened to. If it's just a rant, it really isn't going to get paid attention to you. But if you can couch it in the right terms, it's going to get some response. The last response to avoid is one that is kind of fun to think about, but it's a little crazy. It's called the Urkel response. At least that's what I call it. And it's from that show in the 90s, Family Matters, and you always heard Urkel say, did I do that? And that's exactly the attribute of this response. It's talking, basically claiming ignorance about either the observations or the facts in the facility. It's really talking about how it's confused about the regulations or confused about what's going on. It's really clueless about the regulations and there's no plan of action. And it just kind of says, I don't know what happened. How could this happen in my facility? And this really gives the agency the impression that you don't understand what's going on and you don't really have control of what's happening in your facility. And that's something that the agency doesn't feel comfortable with. And I think the goal of this type of response, the reason some people write it, is that it's hopeful that the FDA will take pity and say, wow, you really don't know what's going on. Well, we're going to educate you and move forward. 
but that's not the attitude the agency is going to have. It's really going to come down with more enforcement action. So be assertive, be specific, and make sure that you demonstrate that you are in control of the facility. So here are some additional tips on responding, but really remember that by responding on your own, you risk some of these mistakes that if you haven't encountered a warning letter before, could really be more costly than actually bringing counsel in on the matter. So as I've hammered here before and I continue to hammer, be specific, address all the issues that are raised. Make sure that you develop a plan of how you're gonna fix those issues and give yourself a timeline to do that. Communicate your plan, communicate your time frame with the agency, let them know what you're gonna do, how you plan to do it, and make sure you stay in touch. Don't let this be a one-time communication, but determine how serious are the violations, how serious are the regulations, what regulations are involved, and what kind of time frame is appropriate, and then stick to that schedule. So before we leave today, I wanted to go over some warning letter statistics, and I want you to consider, first off, that only 673 warning letters were issued in 2010, and as we'll see, that number has really grown. 130 observations in 2013 were attributed to drug and veterinary products. We'll see that's not a very big number. 217 warning letters were given to medical device companies. The bulk went to 275, went to food. This is food, beverage, and dietary supplements. And then we have this huge number left over, 6,760. That's the total number of warning letters issued in 2013. So again, compare that to 673 in 2010, and we see that the agency has been incredibly busy but where did all those warning letters go? This, if you add these up, 275, 217, we're not getting to 6,000. Well, look at the statistics, and the Center for Tobacco Products received 6,052 warning letters. And this is in part because a huge surge in e-cigarettes and some of the confusions about the regulations. So this is unique that we have so many in one category, but in all the categories, we've seen incredible growth. So, you know, tenfold growth and in four years, that's just amazing. So warning letters happen, and there's some tips on how to avoid it. It's been a great pleasure speaking with you, and I hope this has been helpful. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to contact us. We're always happy to provide some complimentary feedback. So again, thank you for visiting, and thank you for listening.